Uh, we are going to be covering Neo4j. This is a hands-on course. So very quickly, what we're going to cover in this session, we are going to talk a bit about what are graphs and why they are amazing. We're going to look at some guides to help you spot what are good graph scenarios. So where would it make sense to use a graph database? We are then going to have a look at the anatomy of a graph database and give you a brief introduction to Cypher, which is the query language that we use in Neo4j. And then the key mark itself, we are going to be hands on. So we are all going to have a go at building a small movie graph and we're going to be using Aura free tier for this. If you are not able to access Aura free tier, we also have the option of using Sandbox as well. In fact, the example that we're going to be working with, you can use anywhere that you've got a Neo4j database, you can access this example, but we will primarily be providing support for access in Neo4j or a free and sandbox. So the login you're going to want for that. So to get ahead of the game. So if you want to do this now, because it does take a few minutes to spin up the or a free tier. So if you go to that link there, so that's dev.neofj.com slash aura hyphen login, you will go to that link and you will be able to you'll be able to go to the console. So there you can register either with so with your social media login. So for example with Google or you can submit an email, use the traditional approach and you will have the options there. So uh, we'll have a look, you have an option there for aura free tier. And then after that, all of that good stuff, I'll give you some links to look at to continue your graphy journey. So let's get stuck in. What is a graph? So a graph is a set of discrete objects, each of which has some kind of relationship with other objects. And this idea of graph graph theory originated from this maths problem that was set in a local newspaper about the seven bridges of Konigsberg. So Konigsberg is, uh, was a town in Prussia, now modern day Russia. Uh, you may know it as Kalingrad, so a lot of football was played there a couple of years ago. And at the time they had these seven bridges crossing over the four rivers there and connecting each of the four land masses. And the problem was posed, was it possible to be able to visit all of the land masses using all of the bridges, but you're only allowed to use the bridge once and only once. And famous mathematician Leonard Euler saw this maths problem and spotted that a big way to go forward in solving this problem was taking this and raising this up to conceptual level and simplifying the problem. And effectively, he said that what you could do is you could take those four land masses, these were the discrete entities in this problem here, and then you could talk about how they were connected to each other, how they were related to each other, and those relationships were the bridges themselves. So effectively, he took the original problem here you've got on the left-hand side and reduced it down to entities and relationships connecting them. And absolutely anything can be represented as a graph. So for example, the internet can be represented as a graph. If we think about the different ways we connect to each other, we are sending each other emails, maybe we are doing Google Meets or Zoom meetings with each other, maybe we're sending media messages to each other, WhatsApp messages, that kind of thing. And if you think about it, potentially one representation of a graph here could be we are all of the discrete entities and then the relationships are the different ways that we are communicating with each other. Also, you can represent the internet by thinking about what makes up the internet. So you think about how we connect to the internet. So our laptops, desktops, smartphones, tablets, we've got internet of things. So various monitoring devices that we use around the home and in industry. And you think about how they're connecting. So we are going to be using things like Wi-Fi. We're going to be using physical connections. These are being connected into routers. And then those are being connected into switches. If we think about the various servers that are managing those things, and then the firewalls and the load balancers, all the way down to start thinking about the physical wires and the, the 
boxes of metal that are storing these things together. So you think about that and how they're all connected. Again, this is something else that can be represented as a graph. And again, graphs can literally be applied everywhere. And you think about, for example, a water molecule. We can represent a water molecule as a graph because we know a water molecule consists of an oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. But it's not just those quantities that give you a water molecule. It's how they're connected. It's the relationship. And it's that specific relationship between how the oxygen atom is being connected to those two hydrogen atoms that give us water. So anything can be represented as a graph. So why do I get really excited when I think about graphs? So I've got a bit of a, a silly example here. And the silly example is very much thinking about trainers. So here is a, I, I've made up this example, but you start to get an idea of what's going on. So we've got three people here. So we've got Jane, Alison and Ian. Notice how I'm very sneakily starting to introduce you to concepts and the anatomy of a graph database. So we've got three persons here, these three persons here, and they've all got a relationship with this product. And this product is of type trainers. It has a price. And we've got some information about their relationships with these trainers. So you can see we've got some dates. So, so we've got Jane here bought those trainers on the 1st of January. Then Alison bought them on the 2nd of January. Then Ian bought them on the 4th of January. OK. Sorry, the no, sorry, 4th of October there. I think I've got the wrong one around there. So we've got some information there. And let's in this example think, well, what happens if we start bringing some data in? Because I've got a hypothesis here. I think there is something going on here about the pattern of how these three people have been buying these trainers. So let's start taking a look. So Jane bought these trainers first. And she posts a message up on Twitter saying, I love my trainers. So obviously very happy with her trainers. Now it turns out that Alison follows Jane on Twitter and reads her post on Twitter. So that has involved in her buying the trainers. And it also turns out that she's also very happy with those trainers. So she posts an update on Facebook saying my trainers are brilliant. Guess what? Ian and Alison are friends on Facebook. So Ian reads her update on Facebook, sees that she's really happy with those trainers. He goes off and buys a pair himself. He posts a picture of them on Instagram and so forth. So you can start to see the real power of not just looking at data as unique entities, but there's a lot to be seen and understood as well when we start to have a look at how these data elements are connected to each other. And this example here, we start to see influence going on in the network and that influence driving decision about what trainers somebody buys. And there's many, many graphy examples. And we're going to look at some scenarios shortly, but just for a bit of fun. Another thing that's really powerful as well when we think about graphs is thinking about friends of friends. So you think about when you're on LinkedIn, on your Facebook, and for example, LinkedIn will recommend some connections with you. And a lot of things that are driving into that factor about why LinkedIn is recommending certain people for you to connect or certain topics for you to follow is it's going to be based on the number of common links that you have with another person. So for example, if I am friends with Anne, Dan, Zane and Jane, and Bob is also friends with Anne, Dan, Zane and Jane, we've got four mutual friends between us. So there's probably a high likelihood that me and Bob know each other, but for whatever reasons, we've not connected previously. So that would be an obvious place where we're using graph and the relationships between the different people to make a recommendation of joining people. And we've got here friends of friends. And something we're going to be looking at later in our hands-on example will be co-actors of co-actors. So it'll make more sense later when we start working with our data set. So let's have a quick look at what's a good graph scenario. So we've talked about many things being represented by a graph and we can represent pretty much anything with a graph. 
let's dive in and have a look at four scenarios to give you a you know, quick heads up as to whether the problem you're looking to solve can be can be a good graph scenario. So scenario number one, does our problem involve understanding relationships between entities? So very quick example here. We have got two customers here, Lisa and Jane, and they both buy T-shirts. So whilst the T-shirts themselves have different properties, they're different colors, different sizes, they all fit into the same product category of T-shirt. And what we can use with this information is that if we've got customers buying the same category items, so for example, let's say Lisa is buying a T-shirt, shorts, sunglasses and a baseball cap and Jane and many other customers are uh, then buy things like t-shirts shorts sunglasses maybe we start to have a look at these overlaps of items we go well hang on a minute so there is some kind of context here so context could be going on holiday so maybe I should be recommending a baseball cap to Jane because she's bought the same three out of four items she's placed in her basket as many other shoppers before her have done that. So we can start to use that insight into the kinds of product categories that people are buying to make recommendations. And this is understanding the relationship between those entities. The relationship here, for example, that we're understanding is between customer and product category. And you tend to see this kind of scenario in recommendations. So we've just looked at that as an example. Fraud detection. So if you think about where, for example, in identity theft or things like that, where you may have different groups of people and they're reusing the same data. So they're reusing the same landline phone number, the mobile phone number, an address, email addresses, that kind of thing. And they change a few things. But if you have a look, there's always some degree of overlap. We can understand those relationships and be able to spot fraud. Finding duplicates. So if you think about some companies, especially if they've been around for a long time and they've got many database systems in place, that they could have the same customer across different databases, but maybe they've misspelled the name a little bit or one's got middle name, one hasn't. There's been a slight typo in the address, that kind of thing. But being able to do look at all of those overlaps and how common uh, elements keep grouping together, we can use that to find duplication in our data and do entity resolution and data lineage, being able to understand where we got data from, how it's been transformed throughout our system, how it's been processed, and just being able to do that data governance of explaining what's happened to a piece of data and where it's ended up. Let's look at the next scenario. So does our problem involve a lot of self-referencing to the same type of entity? So let's think about an employer chart. So you think about the kind of entity we're working here and all of the entities are going to be of type employee because they're all employees of a company. So here we've got Jane and Jane directly manages Jason and Joe and Joe directly manages John. So if I wanted to understand, for example, who are all of the direct and indirect, oh, sorry, direct and indirect employees uh, sort of direct and indirect people that Jane manages then I can do this by just pushing through the tree so this is a really nice example so if you're doing anything where you're working with tree structures those lend themselves very nicely to a graph problem and if you think about it, if you're trying to do this with a relational database you would have to do a lot of lookups against the same table and a lot of self-referencing joins whereas here in a graph database you just basically look for is there a relationship between these nodes? Yes, keep going down. And you'll see this kind of pattern, as we've looked at example here, or organizational hierarchies, access management. So understanding, for example, who's got access to what documents, what teams, how do those rights filter down? Social influencers. So being able to understand who's connected to who. So again, self-referencing will be the same kind of person and just being able to understand how those things are connected together. And another one, friends of friends. So just being able to understand who's connected to who. And again, as we touch an example of our co-actors of co-actors, being able to make recommendations about connections. Let's look at our third scenario. Does the problem explore relationships of varying or unknown depth? 
So we've got an example here of a simple supply chain and we've got three organizations at play here. So we have got the organization We Love Stationery. So they are a stationers who sell pens, pencils, all the kinds of stationery you might want. We have got an ex another company called Pencils R Us. They are all about selling pencils and they sell wholesale quantities of pencils. And we've got our third company, which is We Sell Wood. So they are a provider of raw wood product for other companies to take and process and create into their own goods. So we have these three companies and we can see immediately they're all connected to each other. So let's step through what goes on. So we love stationery. So they are a business to consumer and business to business organization. And as we mentioned, they sell all sorts of stationery and they buy pencils from Pencils R Us. So they buy large stock quantities of pencils from Pencils R Us. And Pencils R Us are a producer of pencils and they buy their raw materials from different places, including wood from We Sell Wood. And We Sell Wood basically manage and have a relationship with many farms around the region and they source that wood and get it processed to a certain state so that it is available for manufacturers. So. What happens here is that Pencils R Us sell pencils to We Love Stationery. They buy their raw materials from We Sell Wood. We Sell Wood buy some stationery themselves. They've got an office and they buy some pens from We Love Stationery. Now, what happens in this scenario here where when We Sell Wood, which is a family run business and they decide that they're going to retire the business, they're going to, you know, Close, close shop, have a quiet retirement, that kind of thing. So what happens to the whole chain when they do this? Well, if we have a look at what happens, they're going to have a knock on impact to Pencils R Us because Pencils R Us were sourcing their raw material of wood from them. So they now have to think about where they can go and get wood from other places. So that's going to have a knock on impact with what they're selling. So what does that mean for the pencils that they're going to be selling in the future, which may have a knock on impact to Wheel of Stationery. So they now have to think about where else can they source pencils from to sell in their retail business. And there might be a small impact, maybe not so big, of we sell wood no longer buying pens, but again, the numbers are probably quite small. So what we can start to do in this scenario as well is put some quantities on here as well to quantify how big the impact is. So you tend to see this scenario in things such as supply chain visibility. So that's an example we've just looked at. Bill of materials. So this is when you are buying a car or a laptop and you know how you get all of those different choices as to what processor you want or what size wheels and all of those things just being able to take that information and being able to see how things are connected again great graph scenario and network management so being able to understand how different things are connected so we talked about earlier how the internet is a great way of representing a graph so if we think about all of those network components in there being able to understand the different depths there. So for example, if a server goes down, being able to understand what is the impact on the rest of your network. And let's go into our last of four scenarios. Does our problem involve discovering lots of different routes or paths? So one of the last conferences I went to in 2019 was one in Edinburgh. So I'm based in London and I took the train and you've got a couple of routes that you can go up. You can either go up the East Coast or you can go up the West Coast. So on my way up, I went up via the West Coast. So my train stopped off in Rugby, Crewe and Lancaster before I got up to Edinburgh. And on the way back down, I decided to go down the East Coast. So I stopped via Newcastle and York. And this is very much the quintessential graph problem. So this is all about thinking about route planning, route redirection, that kind of thing. So this kind of thing you see in logistics and routing. So this is powerful not only for finding the shortest route, and the shortest route could be by distance, it could be by cost, but also what happens, for example, if something happens at Newcastle and I now need to reroute and find a different way to get back home or to where I'm going. Infrastructure management. So being able to manage your infrastructure. So again, we touched about being able to do uh, root cause analysis and if something fails, but also being able to reroute 
in your network if something fails so that you can offer continuity of service without impacting your end users and dependency tracing. So again, just being able to understand that if something is going wrong, what are the dependencies on that? So if a server is going down, what are the virtual services impacted that are being used by your users? So just being able to pinpoint and locate what's going wrong then that part of root cause analysis. So we have had a look at four scenarios. So let's dive in a little bit into what a property graph looks like. So we've already been looking at some of these some of these diagrams. So let's give some names to the details. So we talked about our discrete entities and we call these nodes or in graph theory, they're called the vertex or vertices. And these are the main data elements from which graphs are constructed. And they are, or they can or cannot be, <laughs> they can be connected by a relationship which are also called edges in graph theory. And a relationship is a link between our two discrete entities, our two nodes, and it has a direction, which is indicated by the arrow, and it has a type. And something to bear in mind is you can have nodes without relationships, that's fine, but a re relationship cannot exist unless it is connected to, to nodes. So, Near4j is a property graph database. So as well as having the nodes and relationships, it also has labels. So these are a really handy way of being able to categorize our data. And whilst they're optional, you will pretty much find yourself always using them. So we've got an example here of this node here, and we've applied a label of person. And we've got another node here, which we have applied the label of car. And you can have more than one label. So this is really helpful if you want to try and do some kind of like a views or multi-category of your elements. So we've got an example here of car. And we've also added the label of assets. So in one example, we may want to know about what, uh, what somebody owns, what cars do they own. And let's say there's an insurance policy where we're looking at a car insurance policy for knowing about a vehicle. But if we wanted to do, say, a policy across general assets, then maybe we'd want to label the car as an asset, maybe the television as an asset, a laptop, the bike as an asset. So it's a great way of being able to cross, cross label and cross category things. And last but not least, you can have properties and you can apply properties to both relationships and nodes. And they're a really great way of being able to enrich and add more data and context to your data. So for example, here we have added a property of name and added the value of Jane to our person node. Here we've added make and model as properties to our car node. And we've got the values of Volvo and V60. And you can add properties to relationships as well. And here we are saying not only is there an owns relationship between person and car, but we can say from when that relationship started. So you get an idea of the anatomy of a property graph database. So we're going to have a quick look at Cypher, the query language. And then we are going to have a go ourselves at querying. OK, so Cypher is a pattern matching query language for graphs. And it is a declarative language. So what do we mean by declarative? Basically, rather than if you think about imperative languages where you have to give very clear instructions as to how to execute something, a declarative language, you basically give an ask and then the query engine will figure out how best to answer your query. It is an expressive language. So what you will see is you effectively you will express your query. So you will express things such as um, what kind of pattern you want. So it's very much a pattern matching based language that is expressive. This will make more sense when we look at an example. And we use ASCII art for it. So let's dive in. So you will probably want to take a screenshot of this now. So I'll give you a few seconds to hit your print screen and Mac equivalent buttons, because this may prove useful later when we do the hands on stuff. And let me talk through the thing here. So effectively, we're going to look at some patterns. But just very quickly, let's explain the ASCII art that's being used for this. So when we are 
talking about nodes when we're writing a cipher query to, to deal with nodes. We always use round brackets to refer to nodes. And for relationships, we will use something along the lines of either a double dash, and that means any relationship, any relationship type, any direction. We might say, well, actually, I don't care what the relationship type is, but I do care about the direction. So we can add an arrowhead to indicate the direction. So we can either have an arrowhead this way or an arrowhead this way. Or you can see something we play, uh, represented like this. So I'll explain the square brackets in a second. But all of these are valid relationships. And this one does exactly the same as this one for those of you who are curious. OK, so that is absolutely generic, generic, generic representation for node and for relationship. What if we want a reference? So when we talk about reference here, we're talking about reference, think variable, think placeholder. So if we want a reference for our node, so whatever our pattern matches and we want to get access to the node, we will put in our reference in a bracket. So I've put in here, this can be anything you like. And this is where the square brackets come in play for relationships. So if we want to do anything with the relationship, so if we want to specify relationship type, if you want to put in a reference, which is what we're doing here, then we need to use the square brackets. So square brackets for relationships, round brackets for nodes. Now, if I wanted to get a specific node with a specific label, then again, we use the round brackets because round brackets we use for nodes. And then we use this, this um, syntax of colon label name. So this here would mean I would get, be getting nodes which have a person label on them. So colon person. And we use the same syntax for relationships. Again, we need the square brackets because we want to spec specify something specific from the relationship. So here we are using uh, colon acted in. So one thing to bear in mind, so we use the same syntax of colon and then either the type for the relationship or colon and then the label for the node. But we use upper camel case for the node the label, that's the convention, and uppercase with an underscore to split the words in relationship type. So that is the convention that we use. And these are case sensitive. So whatever you use, keep using the same thing. OK, so we've talked about the generic node or generic relationship. We've talked about if we want to use a reference or variable for the node relationship. We've talked about labels and types. What about properties? So what you will see is if we want to specify an inline property for a node, we use a curly brace and then we use a key value pair syntax. So Here's a key, colon, the value. And we use exactly the same syntax for relationship properties as well. So we use curly braces for properties and we use key value pair syntax for those. And with all of it together, what happens if I want to get at either a node or relationship? I want to have a reference for it. I want a specific label or type with a specific inline property. Well, here we go. So everything to the left of a colon is your reference, so your va your variable. So you don't have to have a colon, but if we're specifying a label or type, it's always to the left. Then we've got our label here, so colon person, and our properties in curly braces. So same idea here. We use the square brackets because we're we want something specific of the relationship. So everything to the left of the colon is our variable, our reference. And then here we've got our type, which is acted in. And in the color braces, our properties. So let's, let's have a look at some examples. If I want to match every single node that I've got in my database and return them all, then I would do match n, so curly brace, curly brackets for our node. n, that's our reference or our variable in there and return in, and that's going to return every single node in our database. If we go, well, actually, no, I don't want to return every single node. I want to return every single person node in my database, so every single node that's got person label on it. Then I would change my query to match brackets again, because it's a node, match n colon, so everything to the left of a colon is our reference, our variable. 
And here we've got curl on person, which is our label, and return n. And that's going to return every single person node we've got in our database. But if I go, well, actually, no, no, I, I want to return all of the nodes in my database that are a person node, and they need to have the property of name with the value of Tom Hanks, then we would do something like this. So it is match, open brackets, so n, this is our reference, curl on person, that's our label. We've got the curly braces, and here we're specifying the property key of name with the value of Tom Hanks, return n. That will return all of these nodes here that are a person node with the value of uh, Tom Hanks for name. Okay, so what we just showed there with the property was an example of an inline. And what we can do as well is we can do something slightly differently. So we can do the same as before. We're looking for Tom Hanks. But rather than having it in lines with the curly braces, what we can do instead is do match p person. So that's going to match all of our nodes in the database that are that have a label of person. And then we can use the where clause. So very similar to what you might do in SQL. And this is where we start to use that, that variable, that, that reference. So we can do the reference dot names. So that's very common in a lot of your programming languages when you're pulling in to your, uh, to your object, so you do p.name, and that's going to refer to our property key of name, equals Tom Hanks, return p, and that will do exactly the same thing. That will return all of our Tom Hanks nodes. OK, let's take a bit more. So we can do range queries as well. So here. We can return nodes with a label of movie, and we want to say not only the movie nodes, but we want to get all of the movie nodes that were released between 1991 and 1999. So we can do the same thing. And this is where the where clause comes into its own, because we can't do range queries with inline properties, but we can when we use the where keyword. So here we go, match m movies where m dot released is greater than 1990 and m dot released is less than 2000 return m so that is very similar syntax to what you would use in sql if that is what you're familiar with so let's extend this so at the moment we've only been working with nodes let's start having a look at bringing in relationships so if i wanted to bring back all of the tom hank Tom Hanks movie. So I want to bring back all of the titles. I would find the Tom Hanks movie note here. Don't be afraid. We've not put a reference in. That's OK. I'm not interested about Tom Hanks note. You can put a reference in there if you like. That's not a problem. I haven't. So I am finding my Tom Hanks note here. Notice I don't care about the relationships. Like whatever connection Tom Hanks has to a movie, that's what I want to bring back. And then I've got my reference here for my movie node. And then I'm returning the title. And this will return a list of titles, so m.title. If I say, well, actually, I want to be a little bit more specific. I want to bring back all of the movies that Tom Hanks has directed in. And I want to order it by the latest movie. Then again, I, find, I put in my Tom Hanks movie. And because I'm asking something a bit specific of the relationship, I'm now using those square brackets to get, tell exactly what I want. So I'm doing colon directed. So I want to get the directed relationship type between Tom Hanks and the movie. And then I'm returning the title. I'm returning the released year. So that's the year of release of the movie. And then similarly to SQL, I'm doing order by and released and descending. So by default, order by is in ascending order. So I put the descending keyword to reverse that. And if I say, well, actually, what I want to know, I want to know all of the co-actors that Tom Hanks has worked with. And notice that I've not said acted with. So I don't care what the relationship is between Tom and the movie, but I do care about the relationship between movie and the people that Tom Hanks has worked with. So again, same idea. I am looking for Tom Hanks. I don't care about the relationship between him and the movie. So I've just got two dashes. I've got my movie node. And then I've got acted in. So I do care about that bit. So uh, acted in relationship with co-actor. So that's my reference. That's my reference. That's a variable I'm going with. And its, it's name is co-actor, colon person. And then I'm going to return their names. So if you look up here, what we're doing is... We've got Tom Hanks, that's our person here. We are then 
going either this relationship or down this relationship. So going down this relationship to movie. And then we're looking at the acted in relationship. And then we can see the person node on there. So that's effectively what that is doing there. OK, so we talked about matching things. Let's talk about creating things before we go and have a go ourselves. So if I wanted to create a Tom Hanks node, I, it's very much the same same syntax we use for match. So it will be create p colon person if I want to use a variable and do something with that node later. So colon person, open brackets, name Tom Hanks. There you go. It will create our node with a label of person with the property of name and value Tom Hanks. If I wanted to create an acted in relationship between my two existing nodes of person node Tom Hanks and movie node of Apollo 13, then I would match those two existing nodes. And then I'd use the create keyword using my variables here, P and M for Tom Hanks and for movie. And I would then add the relationship I want to create between the two of them. Now, what if the Tom Hanks node doesn't exist, the Apollo 13 node doesn't exist, and as we said before, a relationship cannot exist unless the two unless there's two nodes to connect to it. So a relationship certainly doesn't exist. I could create all of it in one go. So I could do this. So I could do the colon person named Tom Hanks acted in movie Apollo 13, and that would create the Tom Hanks node, the Apollo 13 node, and the relationship between the two of them. But be warned. If those nodes already existed, it would create a duplicate of those. So it's not doing anything clever there. So do be careful when you are creating. Right. So I have been talking for a lot. So it is now time for you all to have a go. And we're going to have great fun with this. So what we are going to do is we are going to log in. So we're going to create a database instance. So you can either use Neo4j or a free, or you can use Neo4j Sandbox. So the choice is yours. I will show you. I've got Neo4j or a free already up and running. So oh, here we go. So that's my console. I've got the free version of the database. So you're not going to see it up in here. But if I if you click on Create Database when you log into Neo4j, so I think Alex, can you overlay the link for Aura Free, please? So, uh, so you, you basically you've got the link there. So it's up on the uh, up on the bottom of the screen. There's the captions. If you go on there and log in, then you'll have an option here for Aura Free. So just select that and follow through with the instructions. So you'll be asked to provide a name for your database. You're going to select the free database. So it's not shared anymore. It's free. Click create database. Make sure when you get the password that you make a copy of it and put it somewhere safe. So it will disappear, so you don't want to lose that password. If you do lose your password, it's not the end of the world, but it does mean you will need to delete that database and start again. So do put that password somewhere safe. If you're joining us with Sandbox, so you can go to dev.neofj.com slash try, and that will bring you up to the Sandbox page. So if you sign in, you will get something looking like this. And then all we're going to do is we're going to use the blank sandbox. So you click on new project, click on blank sandbox, launch project, and that's going to go away and create the sandbox in the background. So whilst you're all getting your various instances set up, I'm just going to have a look at some of the questions that have been coming up. And yeah, let's have a look at those. So we've got some questions. So is this case sensitive? So with respect to Cypher, yes. So any of the labels you create, relationship types, property names, those are all case sensitive. So the keywords aren't, but labels, relationship types, property names, all, all are case sensitive. Let's see, we've got and oh, bear with me one moment. Is this session recorded? Yes, this session is going to be is recorded, so you will be able to watch it again later. Can we provide key value pair as nested JSON? So you can't use nested JSON 
within the properties on the node. But what you can do, if it helps, if you have got some JSON that you're looking to load into your graph database, we do have JSON loaders. So there is APOC, I think it's APOC load JSON. So that allows you to effectively go through your JSON object and pull bits out and load it to the node. So you do have that option if that is helpful. Let me just quickly have a look. Oh, so some people have been asking questions about Bloom. Come back on Wednesday. We've got a Bloom session then. Okay, so I think we've got, oh, we've got another question here. Do labels make the nodes unique? Great question. So no, labels are, think of labels as a way of filtering your type. So, I mean, theoretically, you could create a different label name for every node to create uniqueness, but it would be terrible practice. So one, you're limited. There is a limit to the number of labels you can create. I can't remember off the top of my head what that is. It's a large number, but more to the point, it's not an efficient way of creating uniqueness. So a little bit outside the scope of this session, but the way we would recommend for you to create uniqueness in a node would be to have a property or set of properties on your node that define uniqueness. So for example, if let's talk about the people nodes, for example, in the, in the movie database we're going to look at. So perhaps what you would do there is you would define a unique person ID for the node. So maybe you would have a, an ID because they, it, there is a likelihood that there are actors out there with the same name and same year of birth. Maybe there's something else you would use. Maybe the unique factor is an email address. So <clears throat> it's very much based on your data. But what we would recommend is you would select a property or a set of properties that would define what is a unique node. And then you can put indexes and constraints on that so that you can enforce that. Hopefully that helps answer that question. OK, I think those were all of the questions that have come up. Oh, we've got a couple more questions. So how can you add more than one property to an entity? So we're going to see an example of that short, shortly. So watch this space as we look at some of the data that we're creating. But you basically use a, chem a comma separator. So basically, you do your key value pair and then separate each one with a comma. So very much how you would do that in most other programming languages. Another question here, is there any reason or the meaning for calling Neo for J? So I couldn't possibly comment about the Neo part, but the 4J is for Java. So this was back in the time when 4J was a common way of referring to apps that were made with Java. So basically 4J for Java. How would you normalize a relationship? Great question. So something to bear in mind, I think you're referring to mapping tables here. So this is very much a part of the very, very much a part of modeling theory. And I think the best thing I can suggest here is a blog post I very recently wrote that might help explain this. So hopefully, uh, Alex, could you put the caption up for the, the blog post? Yes. Check out that blog post. So that's dev.neofj.com slash rdbms hyphen gdb. So there's a side by side example of what this exact data set we're going to work with, the side by side comparison of the data models, side by side comparison of some of the queries. So it gives you a sense for what's going on and how those data models are different based on the different database techniques we're using. So hopefully that will help. So a uh, question here, how much was the maximum gigabytes data NFJ can handle in-house and cloud with best industry performance? So outside the scope of this conversation, but very, very large data sets. And we're talking terabytes upon terabytes of data. So I would suggest just having a quick Google and have, and have a look. You'll see some examples scattered around the internet. How scalable is Neo4j? Very scalable. Uh, again, I would suggest you have a look at the Node 2021 keynote. There was a very fun demo on there where it was the trillion relationship graph or some crazy number, so very large. So let's have a quick peek what we've got as well. 
Is there any specific session for machine learning? Right. You, you really want to check out Friday when my colleague Claire is going to be doing a session on building a knowledge graph using machine learning approaches. So do check that one out. OK, so hopefully we are all set up. Let's get going. So hopefully you are either set up on the sandbox. So what you want to do here is click on the open button. And that's going to open up near 4 j browser. And if you are on Aura, you will want to press the open with near 4 j browser button. So either of those, you want to get near 4 j browser up and running. If you are on Aura, that password that you carefully took a copy of and put somewhere safe, you will now need that to log in. So you will paste your password here. The username is always near 4 j So near 4 j and then paste your password there. And for those of you who are on Sandbox, you just need to wait for the page to load and the browser will be there. So as a quick reminder, you want to open with browser on Sandbox and you want to open with browser on Aura. So they are both the same. Yes, you can follow along on a local Near4j browser. What we're going to do is exactly the same. So Whilst we are providing support for, in this session for Aura and for Sandbox, you can indeed join in if you've got a local database hosted somewhere. If you're using Near4j Desktop, that is fine. So all of this is exactly the same. And this is why I love this example, and it's one of my favorite examples for working on this. So hopefully, you've all got something that either looks like this if you're on Sandbox, or something that looks like this if you are on near for j or a free. So we are going to be using the movie data set. And we're going to do this by running this command, which is colon play movies. And this is what we're going to use. And just very quickly, if we talk about near for j browser. So this is a developer tool. It allows us to experiment with queries, get some output with regards to what our data looks like. And it's, it's a great developer aid to help us get going. And it helps us visualize some of the data too. And just very quickly, the anatomy of Near4j browser. So this is where we put our commands in at the top. This play button will run those commands for us. And then when we've got some data in, I'll talk a little bit about this icon here as well, which is also useful. So let's go ahead and play uh, colon play movies. And you'll get something that looks like this. So I'm going to do it in both my browser, oh, sorry, in both Sandbox and in Aura. So you'll both, you'll get something that looks like this. Just going to quickly paste the link in the chat for those of you who are on Big Marker. OK, so you'll get something like this. So let's quickly talk about some of the little buttons that have popped up at the top. So you'll notice that they look slightly different between Aura and Aura and Sandbox. And that's just because we've got a different version of browser running. So the pin here, and I recommend you all do this. So this will pin this frame to the top because what you will notice as you run queries, the frames run down. So that pin just makes sure that this one sits at the top. And then let me just make this a little bit bigger so you can see what's going on there. And you've got that same pin as well on Aura. So it all exists in the same place. Then you have this button here. And this is a really handy button if you want to expand the screen out to the whole scene. So I can do this to make it bigger, expand it all out. And I can just press that button again to shrink it back down again. So we've done those. We've we've pinned our thing. So let's talk a little bit about what this is. So when you did colon play movies, colon play is a command to allow you to run browser guides. And what browser guide is, it's one of these. You'll notice we have some arrows. So these arrows allow us to scroll back and forth through this browser guide. You can also see what page you are on at the bottom. And you can, again, scroll that way as well. And these are a really neat, compact way of being able to 
follow a set of instructions and these browser guards you'll see on Sandbox, lots of different examples there. All of those examples have a browser guide and these browser guides will explain to you what data set you're looking at. It will give you a data model in many of them. It gives you clickable code. So you'll notice, for example, here, anything in a gray box, you can click on this and you can run the you can basically push all of the code up. So rather than you having to type all of the code up, you can click on the code and send it up to the code. So you got all these nice things. So they're a really nice way of being able to work for an example. And for those of you wondering, oh, can I create browser guides? Indeed, you can. So if you have a look at our developer guides uh, do documents, if you search something along the lines of Near4j developer guide, browser guide, you should land on the page, which gives you the instructions about how to create your own browser guides. Anyway, those are our browser guides. Hopefully, you're all set up with either Near4j Aura or with Sandbox. If you're still getting those set up, don't worry. You should be able to catch up. So just get them sorted. And we've got breaks as we go through this. So I can answer any questions as we go along. OK, so we've got the movie graph. What is the movie graph? The movie graph is a relatively small yet very powerful data set that really shows us what we can do with the graph database. So I'm going to click the arrow here to move on to the second page. And we're going to be creating our data. So all of you, you can click on the gray box. And as I said, this will send the data up into the screen. So I'm just going to expand this. And I'm going to talk through a little bit about what's going on. So what command are we about to run? So we talked a bit about create. So create means we are going to be creating some data. So let's have a quick look at what we're going to be creating. So we've, we're creating here a movie node. So we've got a label of movie. It has got a reference called the matrix. And then we've got some properties in here. And to answer one of your questions about how can you create more than one property, this is one way you can do it. So as you can see, we've got the curly braces. The round, brace, the round brackets here mean we're creating a node. The curly braces here mean we are creating some properties. And you can see here the key and value pair setup. And then we just use a comma separator. So here we've got a title property, a release property, a tagline property that we're creating for our movie node. And again, we can have a look next one down. So here we are creating a person node. So we know it's a node because it's round brackets. And this one's got a reference of Keanu. And you can see here we're creating two properties for the Keanu node. We have got name and born. So we create a bunch of person nodes. And then we are creating some relationships between those nodes. So we, we know that we've got the create keyword. So let's have a look at what we've got here. So we've got the reference to our Keanu node, which we've just made. We've got the reference to our the matrix node that we've just created. And here we are creating the relationship. So we know it's a relationship because we've got the square brackets. We've got the direction here. So person node goes to movie node. And we've got the uh, arrowhead there to indicate direction. We have got our relationship type here. So colon name, that is our relationship type. And we have got some properties. So some of you may have spotted, hang on a minute, why is this in square brackets? So as well as using square brackets to represent the relationship, we also can have arrays as well in our properties. So here we've just got an array for roles. And I think it's one of the Tom Hanks, what Tom, Tom Hanks movies where he has more than one role. And that's where you see more than one role in that array. But most of the roles here, they're just... Uh, size of one arrays. So we create the relationship between two of them. And you can see the comma just basically means we are just creating a bunch of relationships. So here we're just creating all of the persons to the movies. And then obviously we're adding the directors as well. So we have all of these creates going on. So we're creating lots of data. And then at the very end, we have this query here. So let's just quickly talk through this query. So we have a with keyword. So this is similar to the with you will see in SQL for those of you coming from that background. So 
Tom H is the reference to our Tom Hanks node. Believe me, you'll find it further up. So if you want to have a look later and check if I'm right, I'm right. It's all good. But you can have a look later. So we created a Tom Hanks node and this is the reference for it. And what we can do is we can re-alias it. So what we're doing here is just re-aliasing re the Tom H node to A. You don't have to. We could have just done with Tom H. In this situation, we're just creating a new alias for it. So it was Tom H. Now it's going to be A. And then we've got a match query. So we are matching A, which we know is the Tom H node, which is the Tom Hanks node. So match A acted in M. And you'll go, hang on a minute, there's no label here. That's fine. Because if you remember, we know that structure of person movie relationship. So we know that that's going to be a movie node. So we're going from A to the movie node, and then we're popping back out again. So we know that's going to be a person node, just based on the fact we know the structure of our data. So we're finding the movies and the directors for those movies. And then we're going to return A, which is going to be a Tom Hanks node, M, which is going to be the movies, and D, which is going to be the directors of those movies. And then much like you have in SQL limit, we have limit here as well. And that's going to limit us to the first 10 results. So I'm just going to shrink that. And we press the play button to run that query. So I'm going to run that now and let that graph get created. And you can see this is the last bit of that query that matched Tom Hanks and returned the movies that he's acted in and the directors. So that's what's popped up. So I'm going to give you about two, three minutes. So press the expand button if you like to make this a bit bigger. And what I would like you to do for the next two, three minutes is just have a little play. So do things like click on Tom Hanks and have a look at the bottom at what properties pop up and maybe float the mouse over the actor dim relationship and see what appears at the bottom here. And what you can do as well is maybe try selecting a node and double clicking on it. So double click on it, see what happens. And then you can do things like uh, bouncing it back again. So you can press that little button, it'll unexpand it. So spend about two minutes having a play with that and see how you get on. Okay, so let's have a look at some questions whilst you're having a look. So you've got one question here. Can you talk about tools available for importing bulk data? Absolutely. So you've got some options. So we've done a very crude example here where we're physically writing some code to do the queries to create the data to load it. But you've got some options as well. And this is not this is not the definitive list. There are many more. But you can use load CSV. So that allows you to do an online transactional load of data. So that's really great because pretty much everybody starts off with a CSV kicking around somewhere that they want to load some data from. So you've got load CSV, and that's an online transaction. You can load in a fair bit of data. You've also got equivalents in APOC for load JSON and some other bits and pieces like that. We've got a JDBC option as well. So uh, you can connect to a database using a JDBC loader. So APOC has that handled. We've also got a simple ETL tool to be able to connect to a number of databases if you want to pull data in. So all of these options are transactional online ways of loading data. So the thing to bear in mind with that is they're not going to be the fastest option. Now, if you've got a big flat file of cleaned, deduplicated data ready to load into the database, we have an offline bulk importer and that can suck up huge amounts of data very, very quickly. So that's usually what we'd recommend for you to do once you've got everything sorted and you're loading in a big data set. So you've got that option as well. We have got a number of language drivers. So we have got official drivers in C Sharp, Go, Python, Java, JavaScript, where you, uh, yeah, C -sharp, where you can basically do language-based language-based ways of getting the data into if you want to go via an API, you've got that option as well. So you have got many, many options of how you can get your data into Neo4j. Oh, we've got Spark Importer as well. And we can, we've can we got connectors for Kafka as well. So there's loads and loads. And I've probably missed a bunch as well. So you've got a number of options there. OK, so hopefully you've had a nice play with that uh, clicking expanding the sets. So 
let's continue. So I'm just going to zoom out of that. Oh, I forgot to pin this. So let me just pin this and it'll just send it up to the top. So we're going to navigate to the next slide, the next slide in our browser guide. And we've got a number of queries. So what I'm going to do is I am going to give you about five minutes. And what I would like you to do is go through each of these. So you know you don't have to type these out. So as we know, we can just click on them and they'll send them up to the top. But what I would like you to do is have a look at each one of these queries. And before you run it, try and figure out what does the query do. So I'm going to give you five minutes to do that. If you've got any questions, pop them in the chat. We'll pick them up when we come back. And then we shall move on. So see you shortly. Right. How did we all find that? Good. So let's quickly go through what's going on. So these are slightly different to the queries that we looked at when we were doing an intro to Cypher. So what you'll notice here is we have our reference. We've got match Tom. We know it's a reference because there's no colon at all. So we've got reference and we've got a property. So what this query is going to do, it's going to match all of the nodes in the database and then filter by the property. So all of the nodes have got an, a property key of name and the value of Tom Hanks, and then it's going to return all of those nodes. 
Same idea here for the movie node. So it's not a movie node because we've got colon movie. So this is going to match all of the nodes in the database, put them in the reference cloud atlas, and it's going to filter them by the property key of title with the value of cloud atlas. Uh, here we are specifically finding all of the person nodes. And we know this because we've got colon person. So we've got the label specified here. And then we are returning the people name. So we're using our reference here to get that information. And we are limiting it to the first 10. And last but not least here, we've got the query. We've got our range query. So this should be familiar since we looked at this earlier. So we're going to move on to the next page. And I'm going to do the same deal again. So I'm going to give you a bit of time. And I want you, same idea, try and figure out, before you run the query, try and figure out what's going on here. And we've got a bit of a tough query at the end, so don't panic. We're going to go through that query together, and I'll explain to you all of the bits. But same idea, I'm going to give you about five to seven minutes for you to have a look through this. So I'm going to let you do that, and whilst you're thinking about it, I'm going to have a look at some more of the questions to see what's come up. Right, great question here. Is there a difference between single and double quotes? And the answer is no. But do bear something in mind. So you are completely welcome to use single quotes for your strings. You can use double quotes for your strings. If you've got two or more strings, you can use a combination of double quotes and single quotes. However, for each string, you must make sure you use the same quote that you started with. So if you start it with started it off with, say, let's put the example here with Tom Hanks. So if you start with a single quote, you must end with a single quote. If you start with a double quote, you must end with a double quote. But apart from that, no, there isn't a difference and it's user preference. So I know a few people have asked that they want to, rest they want to restart this data set. So what you can do, you can delete all of the data. So what I would say is hang tight if you can, because one of the last slides in this guide gives you the query to do that. But yes, if you want to come back and experiment with this data set, and I really recommend that you do, then uh, there is a way to do that. So there is a specific command, and we'll talk through that at the end. So if you can hang tight for now and work with the data that you've got, and then I'll show you how to do that. Aha, uh -huh. so we have another excellent question here, which is why does the first query in which we asked for acted in relationship also return a directed relationship in the result? So let's quickly talk about what's going on there. So I think we're referring to the Tom Hanks query, aren't we? So let me just go and come back to this and I'm just going to steal a bit of the query here. Right, so the question here was, let me just run this. The question was, why are we getting this directed? Uh, we had an acted and directed, didn't we? Oh, where is, I think it's Tom, isn't it? Tom's here, acted and directed. Why are we getting that? Let's have a quick look at what's going on in the query and then it'll make sense. So we wanted to know about here, Tom Hanks, the movies that he's acted in. And we want to know about the directors that, directed those movies that is in. And basically what's going on here, where you can see this acted and directed in, what that means 
is that Tom Hanks did a double. So not only did he act in the film That Thing You Do, he was also a director of that movie. So absolutely, it's completely valid to bring that back. So hopefully that makes sense. So we had another question. Can you use regular expressions in Cypher? Yes, you can. So you have got some options there. So I would suggest you have a look in documentations. So you've got some options. And also, if you look at APOC and the various text functions that you have there, you've got a lot of power use regex functions in there as well. So you've got uh, split groups and that kind of thing. So do check those out. And another question that's come up, can you combine two graphs? So I'm not entirely sure what that question is, but I think the best way to describe it is if we're talking about disparate graphs within the same database, then you can do some refactoring on your data. You can run some queries to join the graphs together. So that's going to be very much based on what your business rules are for doing that. If you're talking about two separate databases, then there are options in near for j 4.x where we've got things like Fabric and queries. So not necessarily joining the databases together. There are ways and means of being able to do that. But if you want to join vis-a-vis -vis bringing together a query to bring those sets together, you have options there as well. So I know it's quite a, a fuzzy answer there, and it's outside the scope of this. But hopefully that sort of answers the question there. Ah, okay. No, so there is a question here. Sorry, uh, the question about the acted and directed in relationship. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, yes, there is a bit more about something popping up. So, I will talk about that in a second, which is probably a great time to talk about the anatomy of the database. So, we'll do that in about a minute or so when we come back and talk through the queries. Right, so let's have a look at some of these queries. So I'm going to run all of these so that we can spot the one that came up. So this one, very quickly, this is going to match uh, Tom Hanks, as we know, and this is going to bring back all of the movies that Tom Hanks has acted in. So I'm going to run this query. And I think this is the one that's in question. Ah, the acted in, directed in. So let's explain what's going on here. And it's all going to make sense shortly. So if we have a look at the query specifically, the query here very specifically is saying match the Tom Hanks node and the move. And we know this is a movie node, even though we don't specifically have the movie label because we know the structure of the data in our database. We know this is a movie node. And let's give you a quick example of this. So the thing about Neo4j is it's schema on right. So rather than you think about a relational database where ahead of time you have to say, this is a table I'm going to use, these are all of the fields, these are the types of the fields, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You don't need to do that with Neo4j. So what you do with Neo4j is you just start writing your data to the database, and it's going to figure out what the schema is based on that. And there's a really cool tool here called Call uh, db.schema.visualization. So it's this one here. And this is going to show us, based on the data we've been writing in the database, how does the schema currently stand? So what you can see here is we've got a yellow node here, person. We've got this pink node here, which is movie. We've got all of the different relationship types between person and movie. And look, we've got a self-referencing uh, situation as well. So person follows person. Now, based on this, we know that in this, we know that in this scenario here, when we look at this, that this is a movie node. And we know that because of just based on the data we've been writing in our data model, we know what that looks like. But if we look closer,
closely in this query, actually, what we're telling the engine to return, we're telling it to just return the Tom Hanks nodes and just return the Tom Hanks movies. But we've got all of these relationships here. And somebody spotted that, hang on a minute, why have we got this directed in when we're saying acted in? So let's dig a little bit deeper. So I'm going to first do a bit quick additional tour of near j browser. So if I click on this icon here, this gives us information about the database. And as you can see here, we have got two different node labels in use. So we've got a movie node and a person node. And we've got a total of 171 nodes in the database. And then here we've got the different relationship types in use. And we've got a total of 253 relationships in our database. So quite a small data set, very small data set. And we also have information about, and I do apologize for the property keys, ignore those, that some of those are from a past database. But you get we get some property information there as well. So that's the information that we've got in the database. Now, if I click on this settings cog, we can do a bunch of stuff to configure what our browser guide looks, uh, our browser looks like. And one of the things you'll spot at the very end is this little option here that says connect result nodes, and it's ticked. So by default, this is ticked. And what this means is when we do a query and you've got nodes that are one hop apart, for example, here, Tom Hanks and Movie are one hop apart, it's going to put any connections that exist between those nodes. Now, if I remove this setting, so I've just disabled it, and again, we look at back at this query, and this query is specifically saying we want to return Tom nodes and Tom Hanks movies. So if I now run this, this is exactly what we should be getting. So they, we exactly, again, this, we've got our Tom Hanks nodes and all of the movies in. Now, if we wanted to make this a bit specific and go, well, actually, what we want, we want to have those relationships in there as well. I'm going to pop in a reference. So remember, everything to the left of the colon is our reference. And if I now return Tom, Tom Hanks movies and R, our relationships, and run that, and here we go. And notice that directed has disappeared. We don't have that directed relationship anymore because... We, so we didn't we didn't specifically ask for it. We specifically asked for acted in. So hopefully that makes sense. So I'm going to re-enable the connect result nodes. But if you want to have a play with that, then please be my guest. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, right. So let's quickly look through these. So hopefully all of these make sense. So let's just look at this one. So this is the tough one, the tough query. So let's step through and talk about what's going on here. So this is all fairly straightforward. So we are saying match all of the person nodes that have some kind of relationship to the movie node with the title Cloud Atlas. And we're not specifying any relationship type. We're just putting in a reference or a variable so that we can ask some questions of the relationship if we want to. And then we are returning people at name. OK, we know that. And then we're running this cipher function called type. And what this function does is it will tell us the type of the relationship. So it will tell us. So do you remember we've got acted in, directed? So it's going to tell us what is the type that we specified for that relationship. And then related to, so this is going to give us all of the information about that relationship. So let's run this, and we'll talk through those details. So there we go. So we've run uh, type related in. So it's telling us that Jim Broadbent, the, the name of this person note here, has an acted in relationship to the cloud, the movie Cloud Atlas. And then what you'll notice is when we actually return the related to, because we are specifying properties here, it's not going to come back in that, that sort of like the uh, the the sort of like the, the, the bubbles sort of floating around, it, it will come back as a table. And when that comes back as a table, then what happens is the references to say our nodes or our relationships will come back in this kind of JSON-esque type object. And then we get a bunch of information in there. So let's quickly talk about what's going on. So identity is the internal unique identifier for that relationship. Start is the un internal unique identifier for the node it came from. So this will be for Jim Broadbent. 
End is the unique internal identifier for where that relationship is going to. So this will be Cloud Atlas. It tells us what the type is. So the type, as we know, is acted in. And then it tells us all of the properties associated with that node. So here we can see that Jim Broadbent had three different roles in Cloud Atlas. So that's what that query is doing. So hopefully that all makes sense. So let's move on to the next set of queries. So I'm going to talk through these to begin with, and then we're going to give you a nice chunky amount of time to go and have a play with these because these are great fun. This is where it starts to get really graphy. Up until now, we've very much been doing sort of one hot queries or, you know, sort of one, one traverse or one hop between nodes. What we're going to start doing now is we're going to start doing multi-hop queries where we're spec specifying a number of links. And the first one we're going to be looking at is a Kevin Bacon number. Who doesn't like a Kevin Bacon number? Great fun. So let's just talk a little bit about what's going on here. So remember... We keep talking about if we want to do something more with a relationship. So if we want to specify a type, if we want to associate it, if we want to provide a reference to it, if we want to do anything with properties, we need to use those square brackets. So we've got the square brackets there for the relationship. And we've got some exciting stuff going on here. So we've got this start, this asterisk one dot dot four. So what's happening here is that Asterix is basically telling the engine that we are going to be doing a multi-traversal query. So effectively, we're going to be running across a number of relationships. And then the one to four is basically specifying the range of this. So we're basically saying from one hop to four hops. That's how far we want to do our traversals across the, uh, the relationships. And as you are aware, because we are going between one to four, we don't know what the what the resulting uh, end node is going to be. It could be a label of person. It could be a label of movie. So we're just giving it a reference of Hollywood. And what's going to happen here is we're going to find our start point, of Kevin Bacon. We're going to go up to four hops out. And then we are going to return distinct Hollywood. Now, the reason why we've got the distinct keyword, which is the same as in SQL, for those of you who are familiar with SQL, is that it is very possible that there is more than one path that's going to end up at the same node. So whilst when we get the visualization of different nodes, we're not going to get more than one node. But if we return this data back as a table, then we would get repetition. So distinct is just saying, just give me, you know, just one copy of that node rather than the same node appearing because it features on different parts. So that's what's going on here. So I would recommend you have a go with this. Please don't change the ranges. I'm going to talk a little bit about the asterisks in a second. Uh, and have fun. Try changing the different names here. And if you can't remember what names you've got in the database, a really quick way to get some names is to open up a little database icon here, press the movie node. That's going to give us uh, up to 25 different uh, movie node names. And we can do the same with persons. If I click on the person node, I'm going to get 25 different persons. So if you can't remember the names of some of the characters, then that's an easy way to bring back some person node names. And let's talk about the next query. So that's going to be our Kevin Bacon number. So have a play with that. And the other one is shortest path, quintessential graph algorithm, the shortest path. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on here. So again, we are looking for our Kevin Bacon node. We are also looking for a Meg Ryan node here. So we've got those two. And here we have this asterisk in the relationship. So asterisk means everything. Some of you might be going, oh, you know what I'm really tempted to do? I am going to get rid of this bit here. that's the shortest path and, and this bit here. And I'm just going to find every single path between Kevin Bacon and Meg Ryan. Please don't. So let me talk a little bit about what's going on and how the shortest path algorithm works. So basically... Yes, we've got a very small graph here. We have got a mere 171 nodes and 253 relationships. So this is a tiny graph. However, if you think 
there are potentially millions upon millions of different ways that Kevin Bacon and Meg Ryan are connected. There'll be lots of different unique paths between the two of them. And even with a small graph like this, you can have several million different paths of how they're connected. And this will take a very long time to run this query. So do use the star with extreme caution. Now, the reason why we can use it in this way is because we've wrapped it with the shortest path, uh, shortest path function. And what the shortest path function does, and this is a very simple one, and we've got more advanced ones available in the APOC library and the Graph Data Science library. But what this does is it basically goes off and goes, here's the two start points. It finds a path between Kevin Bacon and Meg Ryan. And here, distance is based on the number of hops it needs to make. So let's say, for argument's sake, first time around, it takes seven hops to find a path between Kevin Bacon and Meg Ryan. The minute it finds another path that's going to take longer than seven hops, it just doesn't bother going down that route. So it discounts them. So what's happening here is as it finds a shorter path between these two nodes, it just discards longer journey. So that's why in this situation, it works fine. So that's the, the shortest path. Now, let's quickly talk about this P equals, because this is new. We've not come across this before. And what we can do is we keep talking about Cypher being a pattern matching language. And basically, everything to the right of a match or a create or a merge, which we've not covered, is a pattern. Now, our pattern can consist of a single node. Pattern can consist of a node relationship node. But they are all patterns. And what we can do is we can do this thing where we put in references for the nodes that we've done here. We've put references for the relationships. But we can give a reference to the path itself. And the path can be a single node. The path could be a series of nodes and relationships connecting each other. And to find, create a reference for our path, we just use this syntax of P equals. And this P could be anything. We could call it path. We could call it Bob. We could call it whatever we like. We can give it whatever name for a reference. So what's going to happen here is we are going to find the shortest path, and it'll be a shortest path between Kevin Bacon and Meg Ryan. And then we are going to put that to a reference of P, and then we're returning P, that path. So I'm going to give you a good 10 minutes, and then we've got a recommendations query coming next. So stay tuned. So I'm going to give you about 10 minutes, maybe just under, and have a go at running these queries and then have a go at changing the name. So maybe let's change it from a Kevin Bacon number to a Meg Ryan number or a Tom Hanks number. So have a little bit of a play and then do the same here as well. If you want to try changing some of the names, do that as well. So I'm going to give you a good bit of time now. So go have a go at that and we'll have a look at some questions. So we have one question about, in the create statement, how do you declare a one to n relationship? So you don't strictly need to declare cardinality when you're writing data. So what you would do if you've got a situation where you've got one to many data coming in, what you would do is there is a number of ways of handling the many. So did you see, for example, when we had the original data, when we created the matrix node and we had all of the person nodes who acted or directed in the matrix? So that's an example of where we've got one movie to many person nodes. And you can, in that example there, what we did was we just kept repeating the create statement. Another thing we can do as well is we can get a collection and then we can iterate over a collection to add the, the, the many components. So there's lots of different ways of doing that. So you don't need to declare the many bit ahead of time because, as we said, near for j it's schema on right. So we don't have to tell the database ahead of time that we've got different, for, different values for cardinality. We just handle that at the time of write. And there's a number of ways of being able to do that.
Right, so hopefully you're having fun with that. So you've got a couple of minutes left. And I'm going to pick up a couple of really interesting questions that have popped up. So one question's popped up saying, some queries return as a table, others return as a graph. Why? Great question. So basically, uh, so this is a this is a developer aid, the browser tool. And what determines whether something's going to come back as a table or as a graph is very much on what query we're asking. So as an example, this one here, we are not returning any properties. We're returning nodes. So what that means is this is going to return back a graph. So let's just quickly run this query. So the visualization that pops back is a graph. But what you can do as well is you'll notice you've got some buttons here. So if you go, well, actually, I'd prefer to have a look at uh, like something in a tabular format. Then if you click on this, because we've re we're requesting Hollywood, which is a node, we get these sort of JSON-esque type objects coming back. So you can see here, we, we spoke about this earlier when we did it on the relationships. So here we've got on the nodes. So here you can get this data back in this format. And it's kind of a, a, a table setup. But because we can, because a graph can be returned, that's what it's going to return. Now, if we have a look at some of our pre previous examples, so where this one here, what you see is we are returning a property and the only thing we are returning is a property. And as a result, that's going to come back as a table. So just because it's a graph database does not mean you can't return back tabular data. Absolutely, you can. The graph bit is all about being optimized for working with connected data. That's the graph bit. It doesn't mean you're only ever going to exclusively get graph visualizations back. So absolutely, you can get either tabular data or graph representations. And the reason why you'll get back tabular data is because what you're effectively requesting are properties. And as a result, it's going to come back as a table. So hopefully that makes sense. And another question we had to come in as well was about the concept of primary and foreign keys and how they work in a graph database. So let's quickly pop back to one of these. Let's pick a smaller one. Have we got a smaller one? Oh, yeah, this will do. Let's, let's go back to handy Tom Hanks. So whilst we haven't got it here, absolutely, you can still have the concept of a primary key where it makes sense. So let's say, for example, we had a customer database and we have primary keys for customer records. We've got a unique identifier for the customer records. I'm going to move away from primary key and use unique identifier as a concept instead. Absolutely. You can have that unique concept, which could be a unique identifier for your customer. So let's say the, these were, uh, the, this was a customer node. Then you can have that unique identifier. And that's a great way of being able to sync across your different data sources. But the key thing here, and I will refer you again to the blog post, as we've got an, um, an example here of the differences between a relational and a graph database, is that the reason why you have this idea of primary keys and foreign keys and so forth in a relational database is because you're using mapping tables. So you've effectively gone through this exercise of normalizing your data. And you normalize your data. So you get you try to come back down into tables and you're trying to do that to reduce duplication. And you're doing that to many reasons, save space and also reduce the complication of making changes and any kind of uh, and any kind of I've forgotten the word. Anyway, when you've got changes across your, your data state. So effectively, that's why you're doing the normalization. And for you to be able to rejoin data together. So let's say you've got a customer table and let's say you're in a situation where customers have got multiple addresses. So let's say business customers as an example. So it's very possible that you have a customer table and then you have an address table and you are going to have some kind of a mapping table as well to be able to map the, the primary key from your customer table to the primary key in your addresses table. So you'll have some kind of mapping table together. So that's why you have the foreign keys and, and the primary key so that you can reconstitute that, that data together. So if you've got a customer with 10 different addresses. You're not going to have that customer repeated 10 times with the different addresses. You have one customer in your customer table. You have 10 addresses in your 
in your address table and you will have 10 references in your mapping table in between of those. Now, this is completely different because in a relational database, this is all about join, a relational database is all about joins on read. So when you do your query, you will do your joins at the time of read to join these things together. And this is where the primary keys and foreign keys will come into play. With a relation with a graph database, as soon as I know that this node is connected to this node, I do a join on right. I create a physical connection between my Tom Hanks node in this example and the Da Vinci Code node. And as a result, I don't need a mapping table because that relationship is serving that purpose of a, of a mapping table. It's directly connected. And we're moving away from this idea in a relational database where we have to try and hypothesize how the various tables are connected together. And we're going to do that with a mapping table. Maybe we've got some self-referencing going on. And in a graph database, it's like, if it's connected, we take for granted that it's connected. So if there's a connection there at the time, as we're querying it, it's going to pop up because we put that connection in at the time of write. So we kind of go away from this idea of having to worry about foreign keys and that kind of thing, because that relationship takes care of it. So these are quite different like models of thinking. They're quite different data storage techniques to put those together. So hopefully that makes sense. OK, right. Hopefully you've all had lots of fun with this. So you may have spotted it is a very small data set. So some things may not have the shortest path between them. Some actors have terrible bacon numbers, but hopefully you had a nice bit of fun with this. So let's move on to the last exercise of the day. So we're going to talk through these queries and then I'm going to give you a bit of time to play with these. So let's have a look at these queries. So we are doing a recommendations query. So the first one is looking at trying to find brand new co-actors for Tom Hanks to work with in his next movie. So what we're doing here is we're matching the Tom Hanks node. We're looking at all the films that he has acted in, so all the movies he's acted in. And then we're finding all of the co-actors that he worked with previously. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take those same co-actors and we're then going to go away and look at the movies that they've acted in and find their co-actors, which we're calling co-co-actors. So the co-co-actors are the co-actors of the actors, co-actors of Tom Hanks. But we have to do a bit of filtering here because what we don't want to do is it's quite possible that some of those co-co actors are actually co-actors of Tom Hanks already. So we want to make sure we get so the sort of not key basically says they're not this pattern. So we're going to get rid of any co-co actors that Tom has already acted with. And the other thing we want to make sure as well is we don't want to have Tom recommended as a Coco actor. So it's quite possible that we pick up Tom as a Coco actor. And this is how we do the not equals in Cypher. So basically, it's the greater than less than signs put together like a diamond. So that's going to get rid of Tom out of the Coco actors. And then what we're going to do, we're going to be returning a table. And here we are returning the names of those Coco actors as recommended. So these are the recommended Coco actors. But we want to do some kind of strength behind it. So we want to, how, how do we recommend the better Coco actors to recommend rather than the other ones? And the way that we're doing strength here, and this is where it starts to get really powerful and exciting when we look at the graph, is we're going to do that by the number of times that Coco actor has appeared. So do you remember we talked a little bit about friends of friends? And we talked about this idea that if I'm friends with Anne, Dan, Zane and Jane, and Bob's friends with Anne, Dan, Zane and Jane, well, this is the same principle. So what we're basically saying here is we're trying to find the co-actors co that have as many co-actors, different co-actors in common with Tom Hanks. So the more co-actors they have in common, the higher we're going to recommend them. So the idea being because they've got so many, you know, there's so many co-actors in common between the co-co actor and Tom Hanks, they're going to be a great fit. You know, we absolutely want to recommend them, you know, rather than say the one co-co actor that Sony sort of acted with one co-actor, one co-actor in common with Tom Hanks. So that's what's going on here in that query. 
And then the next part of the query, well, great. Okay, so we've had a look and one of the co-co-actors that comes out strong in our recommendations query is Tom Cruise. So who can we find that knows both Tom Cruise and Tom Hanks to introduce them to together? So let's have a look at what's going on here. So again, same idea. We're going to match Tom Hanks and he acted in a movie and we're finding the co-actors of those movies. And then using those co-actors we found in the first part of the query, we are going to go and find all of the movies. So all the movies that they acted in with Tom Hanks. So this is kind of a... So this is kind of like an intersection query. So all of the co-actors that come up here, some of them are going to get filtered out because they will not have acted in a movie where Tom Cruise has always acted in them. So this is going to send down the number of people that we've got. And then so that's going to leave us with a list of people. So what we're going to do now is we are going to return Tom for Tom Hanks. So we're going to return the movie that that co-actor starred in with Tom Hanks. And then we are going to return the movie that the co-actor works with with Tom Cruise. Great. So I've talked enough. So I'm going to give you about another, about sort of three, four minutes to have a play with those queries. And then we are going to wrap up and have a look at what's next. Okay, hopefully having a good bit of fun with this. And again, I highly recommend you come back to this example. It's always available. So do have a play with some other names afterwards. So we are slowly coming to the end of our session. So let's just move on to the last one. So if some of you have asked, how do you do a refresh? How do you start from scratch? So you've got a couple of uh, commands here. And what this is going to do, this is going to remove all of the data in your database. So this works well for small data sets. So as you remember, match N, that matches all of the nodes in our database. Detach will attach all of the relationships connecting those nodes. And then delete and will delete all of those nodes. So this will delete absolutely everything in your database. 
And if you want to make sure that everything has been deleted, if you then run this command afterwards, you will return nothing. So that is how you can clear up your database afterwards. So a couple of words on the movie graph. Please do go and have another go. So you can always spin this up. So it's colon play movies. It's always available. Do go back, go through the queries at your own pace, experiment, see what happens. It's a nice friendly data set to get going. It's available absolutely everywhere where you've got access to Near4j browser. So please do spend some time on that. And let's finish off. So how do you continue your graphy journey? So hopefully you're all super excited. So first of all, I just want to remind you that this is a week of training and we've got lots of exciting things coming up this week. So on Tuesday, my colleague Jennifer will be doing a hands-on session on Aura Free Tier. So she'll be extending a bit what we've been doing today and she'll also be discussing things such as getting connected. So I know some of you were asking about connection options, so do tune in tomorrow. On Wednesday, I'll be back and I'll be showing you how to get started with near for j Bloom, which is our visualization tool. On Thursday, my colleague Will will be doing a session on building APIs with Near4j GraphQL. So that's a really great way to have a look at options of how you can connect through and how GraphQL fits in with the whole Near4j graph database story. And on Friday, my colleague Claire is going to be doing a session on creating a knowledge graph and she'll be using machine learning approaches. So NLP and Python libraries to support that. So it's going to be another cracking session. So all of these sessions start at 1 p.m. UTC. So that's 9 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, 2 p.m. UK Time, 3 p.m. Europe Time and 6.30 p.m. Indian Time. So lots of content. All of these sessions are recorded and will be available immediately at the end of the session on youtube.com slash near for j So you'll be able to find that. For those of you registered, I'm sure we'll be sending an email reminder with the specific video links too. So if you want to read a little bit more about it, you've got a link there as well. There is a blog post with a bit more of a description for all of the training courses if you want to find out more. So continuing your journey. So hopefully you're super, super excited. So there are a number of things that you can do to enrich your knowledge of graph databases. So a really great place to have a look is our Graph Academy page. So that's dev.neofj.com slash learn. And you've got a completely free set of different tutorials there. So everything from graph data modeling, Cypher, graph data science, and you can also get a free certification scheme there as well. So you can become a certified developer in Near4j in our graph data science library. And you can get a free t-shirt as well if you pass. So do check that out. You can also check out a large plethora of videos. So you will find things about how to, best practices, hands-on examples, community stories, use cases, the works. And you've got a lot of content, for example, there from my colleague, Will, who does a lot of stuff around building applications with Near4j and using React for that. And my colleague, Adam, has done a lot of stuff in the JavaScript space. So you've got a huge amount of content there. And last but not least, come along and join us in the Near4j community. So we have got a Discord forum. So that is dev.neofj.com slash chat to come and say hello. We also have a discourse forum and that's dev.neofj.com slash forum, where you can post more in-depth questions there as well. So do come along and say hello. And last but not least, if you've got any questions for me, you've got my contact details there. Do give me a shout as well on Twitter. I hope you've had an absolutely fantastic session. I hope you've learned loads. We've been answering your questions as you go along. But if you do have more questions, and again, do drop them either on the forum or on the Discord on the Discord site. So those are both really great places to reach out and ask for help. Thank you very much for joining me and have a fabulous day.